Hello guys, this is Adike Daniel TV. If you are yet to subscribe to my channel, please look at the notification bell on your phone, tap the subscribe button and subscribe to my channel. Today on my channel, I want to tell you what's happening in UNN currently. They are represented by the Commissioner of Information and Strategy for the State. My own Governor, His Excellency, Flight Honorable, Flight Honorable, who is represented by our own dear Professor Malaki Okweze who has always been here. Vice Chancellor University of Nigeria, Dean of the Faculty of Biological Sciences, please may I humbly be allowed to identify the already established protocol. Coming here is a thing of joy. And being able to see some of my old friends. I feel like just staying here for, the, for several more days just to think about the past years, those years that we shared together with many of you. I won't start mentioning them, but many of them are seated right here. I salute all of you, especially my own very dear colleague, Professor Lee Wood. I thank all of you for the reception already received at the Vice Chancellor's office by the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Administration, Professor Hugo. Uh, he received us so very well. I want to say a big thank you to all of you. You know, one thing about universities is that they endure. Things happen, things come and go. The universities are always there. However, things are changing, and I would allude to that as I go through this lecture. I think it's particularly a thing of honor for me to be asked to deliver the 15th any talk of Professor Amy Jocko lecture. A lot has been said about Professor Jogo and okay. his um, profile is also contained in the material that has been given to you. I am it an honor to be invited to deliver the 15th Indian Jogo Lecture organized by the Faculty of Biological Sciences of University of Nigeria and Soka. I congratulate the faculty for keeping this lecture series alive in spite of the prevalent hardship in the hand in the land and within our national institutions in Nigeria. The topic I am to speak on is science and technology as allies with good governance in wealth creation and poverty reduction. The issue of poverty in Nigeria is of grave concern as crippling poverty is decimating and traumatizing the preponderance of the Nigerian population. The horrific level of insecurity of life and property in Nigeria has attained unprecedented and alarming levels. There are many causes for these multifarial challenges facing Nigeria. The greatest being the gross level of corruption and ineptitude within the ruling class, which sees governance as a means of amassing illegal wealth and self-aggrandizement. I would like to state at this point that I'm so happy that many students are here because some of the things, a lot of what will be said this afternoon will have to do with you and how you order yourself to become a more than conqueror 
in the type of country we have eventually become. The results of this malady, especially in attitude and governance circles, include the fact that businesses are dying in droves, food security looms large, as headsmen rampage their farms, plundering and pillaging and sacking farmers. The for example is so very vivid, where a whole town was almost sacked by these headsmen. Capital flight is taking a toll on our productive capacity as a nation. Foreign direct investments are at the lowest levels in decades as investors are scared about investing money in Nigeria. Already inadequate health facilities are overstretched, making us a nation of sick and dying people. Internally displaced persons are increasing at alarming rates, causing major unhealthy demographic imbalances within the turbulent areas. Other sectors such as education, infrastructure, etc., are gravely underfunded and are dying by installment. Anarchy prevails as people take the law into their own hands in the face of a demoralized armed forces unable to protect the citizenry. All of the above and a lot more of their lives plaguing Nigeria have brought us on our knees as a country and compelling us to look for ways to solve these problems. Since a majority of criminals cite poverty, hunger and starvation as their motivation to engage in criminal activities, reducing the level of or outright elimination of poverty will go a long way in healing our healing economy and populist socio-economic situation. As scientists, we can form a formidable alliance with the governance structures to reduce poverty drastically and make Nigeria a country that people will desire to live in again. The number of Nigerians leaving the country daily is symptomatic of a failed state. We can reverse this trend by insisting on and allying with good governance structures to create a country that we all will be proud of. Diminishing returns from science and technology research and ventures such as this in Nigeria is creating a disturbing gap in development strides and popularizing the masses instead of creating wealth and liberating them from poverty. The effect is also evident in poor governance structures that apply anachronistic methods to address space-age problems in an age of information superhighway. The current thing intends to suggest ways of addressing the yearning anomaly by leveraging science and technology for good governance and wealth creation. I just remember that a governor once sacked a commissioner for attempting to solve practical problems with theoretical solutions. That's exactly what we are seeing all over the country, Nigeria. Both governance structures and the attendant policy issues have impaired the growth of science and technology, which in turn has imperiled the foundation for a robust and competitive future generation. The professional performance of our graduates in this area have been quite below par. Our university products are not only strategically efficient, they are also essentially nationally relevant and globally uncompetitive. The failure of our education at the primary, secondary and tertiary levels has worsened the picture 
Home Depot government applying strategic planning and instituting sound education policies can remedy the situation we found ourselves in. Nigeria government's abysmal performance in adequately funding science and technology at all levels of education is resulting in a game of woes in the industry coupled with massive brain drain amongst our young generation and spreading poverty all over the country. Nigeria is now rated as the poverty capital of the whole world. That is most unfortunate. But this can be reversed when we begin to think outside the box using science and technology. A situation where the brightest winner of science or technology fair is given a laptop worth 200,000 naira, while the winner of Big Brother Nigeria will haul away up to 80 million naira is a clear depiction of where our priorities as a people lie. Beauty and vanity pedants and so much more. <laughs> Unfortunately, beauty and vanity pedants and so much more than intellectual pedants and our youth know this very well. In addition, work ethics, especially in the public sector, has reached an alarming decaying stage, and most workers only talk about receiving an alert at the end of the month, where high productivity levels keep lagging. It's not the time to talk about work ethics, but the problem is, if you cannot work well for somebody else, you cannot work well for yourself. So, if you are in a system and you are unproductive, you can extrapolate that when you establish your own company, in order to go out of poverty into wealth creation, you will suffer the same thing. Everywhere nowadays, you hear several suffer. You went to God, has a lot of has a lot, but nobody is talking about the world. They are talking about the land. I wish I could find the person that defines that terminology. I would like to give you a point in the news on diverting Nigerians' attention from productivity to just any exercise. When you talk about good governance structure, science and technology combined with ICT have shrunk the world into a global village making communication between the government and the government a lot easier. The ubiquitous nature of this phenomena is compelling government to adopt the principles of accountability and transparency in governance. Sensible governments know that gone are the days when crooked, corrupt and inept government or government could be masked or covered by the death of public information or information that government just want the masses to have. Science and technology have unmasked the mastery and laid bare their nakedness. It is now easy to assess the quality of government using tools that make it difficult for government to lie about their activities and expenditures. In addition, Science and technology have simplified procurement processes, making them more transparent and inducing accountability where good governance is desired. When you look at our country, everybody knows the governors that are performing. They know when presidents are performing. They know when local government chairmen are chairwomen are performing. So you can't hide your ineptitude from the people. Many years ago I came up with the idea that ineptitude and incompetence is worse than corruption. 
Because if you have a corrupt government that is intelligent enough and creative enough, they will steal, but they will also produce. But when you have, if you have a government that is ruled by all sense, people who are not even sinners, which is impossible, but they are so inept and incompetent, they will not produce anything. But in Nigeria, when you now have a government that is both the devil with corruption and ineptitude and incompetence, you know that drug is done line for life. And that is our problem today. Incompetence, ineptitude, income, and uh, corruption. All the three. So we need to take care of this thing. Innovations in science and technology have made healthcare delivery. Technology have made healthcare delivery, environmental management, security issues, infrastructural development, etc., much easier to provide. Agriculture food chain development and other necessities for improvement of quality of living have been much impacted by science and technology, making it easier for governments to achieve more good governance mileages with much less resources. I want to pass a thank you note uh, through the commissioner uh, to Governor Hope Uta for the first time in the past nearly 30 years. Two weeks ago, I was able to drive from Ibu to Okiwe and from Okiwe to Owele. From Okiwe to Owele, not a single pothole. Not one. I was so fascinated. This is a road that my wife and I will fly and endlessly. When you can sleep and be carried all through without a problem. Another assignment, please, tell the government that this move he is making to make sure there is a deep sea port as well as that. That if he does it, he will now be never forget it. Let us go ahead with that. We need a seaport in England, and I hear that Governor Godinma is trying to make sure that that happens. If we define good governance in terms of bridging the government at their points of physical, material, security, economic, and social political needs, then science and technology have been playing and could be better leverage to play even greater roles. Rapid dissemination of information, robust infrastructure, sound transportation systems, pervasive telecommunication infrastructure, affordable and accessible bandwidth for internet connectivity, thriving, sustainable and implementable education policies, etc., are all driven by strategic deployment of science and technology and remarkably promote good governance. Where science and technology are fully deployed and utilized, you will see transparency and accountability. And where these two are, you will see good governance. That is why we said that we can leverage science and technology with good governance to reduce poverty and create wealth. That is the theme of this very lecture. UNIACA, United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific, has adopted some blueprints for good governance which include the following. It is participatory. That is, it is inclusive. It is consensus oriented, which means that all stakeholders are heard. It emphasizes accountability, which I think is the sine qua non for good governance. Without accountability and transparency, there is no good governance. Next, it is transparent. That is open governance structure where everybody would want, would be able to see what you're doing. 
It's just like now, as um, the judiciary, there is a trial now, and um, the opposition has come to court for one couple. They believe that the elections were rigged. And then some people, including the umpire itself, is saying that we don't want this thing to be broadcast. Let nobody say it. My question is the same question people have been asking. What is INEF hiding? What are they hiding? That is lack of transparency. So transparency is very critical to good government. It is responsive that it, it meets the needs of the government. It is effective and efficient. That is, it has strategic management as its rudiment. It ensures safety and it follows the rule of law. These are just some of the items that have been stated that make for good government. So to the above parameters, security and sustainable development could be added, all of which science and technology could be strategically leveraged to maximize their results in a sustainable way. The paradigm shift to e-governance is also addressing issues of productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness in governance. Strides in science and technology is facilitating this development and showing better ways to create wealth and reduce poverty. How do we go about this? Leveraging science and technology for wealth creation is already being achieved in many clients. The Industrial Revolution was a remarkable catalyst for wealth creation, which of course is a product of science and technology and engineering. Since then, science and technology have been the sustainer, the driver, and the custodian of the Industrial Revolution. Most small and medium enterprises fly on the wings of science and technology, which have jointly brought innumerable innovations to the manufacturing and industrial sector. Such innovations have drastically reduced level costs while improving quality and utility values so much. With wealth creation comes the concomitant increase in job creating enterprises. Science and technology have given birth to virtually the most mechanized devices used in trade and industry. The potential for wealth creation here cannot be overemphasized. From manual use of equipment to mechanized production, reducing time and process for manufacturing, all have brought about a countless number of spin off enterprises which in turn creates jobs and reduces property. Both the real sector and the service sector have seen geometric growth in spin-up industries resulting in wealth creation at all levels. At the artisanal level, low levels of technology have been, is being utilized to create wealth and employment on a large scale. Scientific and technological tools are becoming commonplace even at the artisan level. From the barber hairdressing salons to the massage parlors to the auto mechanics to the carpenters to the office and home cleaners to car operators like Uber and so on, the signature of science and technology is very prominent. Artisans who have leveraged on it make a lot more money than those who choose to remain antiquated or retain antiquated methods or remain analog in a digital world. The advent of universal adoption of information technology has placed an intelligent terminal on the desk and even lap and palm of everyone. Gone are the days of having to hook up to a grand supercomputer at who knows where in order to address governance, technological or wealth creation issues. This reality is emancipating and should be maximally and extensively utilized for wealth creation and poverty reduction. 
Biotechnology and nanotechnology are probably going to define the direction of innovative technology for the future. Good governance would encourage massive cooperation, co investment in research in this frontier area. Ensuring innovation and their development should guarantee sustainable wealth creation and the onset, onset of the 4G, 5G. I'm sure many of you have heard about the new 5G technology that is replacing the 4G. Even though some of us are still using 3G, and um, some are already on 4G, but they are still a drive to compass to 5G. And there is a problem, and there are books of the 5G that the fifth generation of wireless technology. What are some of the advantages? They are more effective and efficient in the way they process information. They can produce and provide huge broadcasting data in gigabit formats to support 60,000 connections at the same time. Something that is almost a nightmare for even 4G to do. They are easier to manage with previous generations. Another one, they create great impact on our lifetime. So the way we walk, the way we play, the way we entertain, the way we interact, the way we live. Next day, it comes with increased bandwidth compared to 4G. Next also is there are quicker downloads, reduction of lags. In a twinkling of an eye, you get the information you are looking for. Another one of the advantages is that businesses and organizations will be more efficient and consumers will have much better and faster access to information. Next, of course, it can increase network capacity up to 100 times that of 4G. You can see by orders of magnitude, then it is high speed, high capacity networking, improved reliability, and then improved phone calling by us. But what are some of the disadvantages? Today, no matter what you hear, there is no global saturation yet for 5G. And the reasons are obvious. Cities will benefit, but rural areas will take decades, at least one decade, in order to catch up with that technology. So it is not yet prevalent. It's a technology that will advance up and help to remove a lot of the things that tie us down to poverty and help us to create wealth. But there are disadvantages. So, one of the advantages is that it totally renders 4G and others obsolete when it is fully deployed. It will make them unattractive. Next, technological exclusion of countries that cannot afford it. And you can think of Nigeria as one. In fact, I think it was um, uh, uh, the governor uh, in his opening remarks that talked about people are going to space and we are here doing nothing. You know, there was a joke that was popular about 20 years ago about that. Just about the time, just before I became vice chancellor here. I became vice chancellor here 19 years ago. So it's a long time. And they said that Japanese scientists came up with an idea that stormed the world. And what was the idea? They said that they put everything, development indices, into operation and try to model what the world would be in, in 50 years. And they discovered that Nigeria will be ruling the world in 50 years. 
So American scientists, we are not happy with that. And they said, how can they say Nigeria, not even UK, not even US, or France, or Germany, or even China that is building its way? How Nigeria? So American scientists now went and did the same modeling and came up with the same conclusion. And their conclusion was that in 50 years' time, Nigeria will be ruling the world. And the people asked why. And they said, because by then, everybody else will be in space. Only Nigeria will be in space. <laughs> so we are moving. And we are working with them. So what are the other disadvantages of 5G? Current cyber criminals may have a field day if they successfully break into the system. So security problems and possible data insecurity will be prevalent. Next, insufficient infrastructure. Now to handle it. We don't have the infrastructure yet, especially in Nigeria. Next is radio frequency might become a problem. That the required range of frequency that is greater than 6 GHz, which is already crowded by other signals, like satellite links, etc. Too many signals crowding, crowding base frequency, crowding, crowding base frequency range. So it will be a disadvantage. And then of course, increased bandwidth means less coverage. You have a lot of materials for this conflict, but not extensive like the other generation. So these are some of the things that we need to we need to ask ourselves, what is happening? What are we doing about this thing? And I want to sound a note of warning. And it's not part of this lecture per se, but it's part of it because it's a university um, environment. And it's good that our students and our lecturers know what is happening. And brace up to face the future. There are things that are taking us slow. Number one, our universities are totally out of tune. We want the modern paradigm shift to functionality as against the mundane principles. We have remained in ivory towers. We are not taking science and technology even to the masses. There used to be a time when UNN was so powerful in agriculture that they revolutionized agricultural system by extension program. Those don't even exist anymore. We are now comfortable as sitting in the Ivory Tower, inviting students to come to us to learn, but it's not going to last. I want to assure you that the conventional university will eventually fade away. Within the next two to three decades, universities that we know them today will no longer exist. So it is important that UNF begins now to think about how to adjust and how to adapt to the current situation and then brace up for the future. Part of this reason, our universities and the curricula we have are obsolete, retrogressing, and falsifying. I admit that in 2005, I was co chair for setting up the minimum standard, the benchmark and minimum standard for engineering in all of Nigerian universities. That was 2005. I co chair with the then Vice Chancellor of Unilife. But in 2007, I was the single chair working with Corel and the Nigerian Society of Engineers for setting up postgraduate benchmarks and minimum academic standards for postgraduate, for postgraduate engineering studies in Nigeria. But by then, we had not fully seen what, where we are going. There were some things we interjected that I believe NEC has reflected upon because they took all our recommendations and then sent this to universities. But there are some that were not captured. Most of our university lecturers have chosen to remain anachronistic. 
is both their expertise and then their style of delivery of knowledge. How on earth are you still using chalk and board to teach your students? How? But that's what we're doing. That's what is prevalent. That thing will no longer be there some years from now. Most of our graduates are deficient in mathematical and communication skills. I tell you the truth. I wish I had a way of publishing some of the letters my father wrote to me when I was in secondary school. A typical BSc, MSc, BAMA cannot speak the English my father spoke when I was in primary school. I tell you the truth. Why? What is happening? Okay, we have a problem with mathematical skills, but why must we have a problem with communication skills? We can't even sell our idea. Many years ago, I was deputy vice chancellor in the State University of Science and Technology, and I was still teaching. And a student wrote me three pages. I said, what are you writing? He said, my course has kept her from graduating for a couple of years because I could not be compromised or do what others do. So she wrote three pages to appeal to me. I read the document and I wasn't sure whether it was English or Latin or German or French. So I called the SI agent, my secretary. I said, please, you know, I don't have the time, I'm limited on it. Please read this and make a summary of what this student is talking about. After two, three days, they came back and said, I don't understand whether this is English. Three pages, no full stop, no comma, no semicolon, nothing, no, nothing, no capital letters, everything is small, small letters. So three pages. Then one day, a dean, the lady was dean, I said, she's a mother figure. She came into my office, I gave her the same letter. I said, please, could you, prof, could you read this thing and give me a synopsis of what this student is talking about? She returned it later. Nobody knew. Final year engineering student could not even communicate one sentence that was correct in three pages. How did that happen? Because many of them came in from direct entry. It was later that we saw what was happening and that was where we started examining all those who came from direct entry only to find out that 90% of them came with false transcripts. 90%. So many of these people never even went to secondary school, let alone higher school or polytechnic they claim to have gone to. So I took the bull by the horn and the vice to told the vice chancellor what was happening and we sent people all over to find out. The results were startling. They even forged transcripts from UNICEF. Every year, only at our belly did we see one out of 11 cases, only one transcript was genuine. The other 10 we are forged. Now, these are the people we bring in. So, how can they meet up with what we have on the ground? Communication skills, nowhere. Numerative skills, nowhere. Most courses taught in the universities neither prepare students. Uh, neither prepare students or graduates for employment nor for self-employment in starting their own businesses. I urge you, undergrads of UNN, because I beg you, don't go to school thinking that one day your uncle or auntie or parents will help you to find a job. Start looking for your own salvation now by acquiring legitimate skills. Legitimate skills. While modern universities are shedding their average hour gap, 
and turning on the entrepreneurial university model, Nigerian universities remain in the mode of obsolescence with regard to the industry need and societal demand. There is absolutely no synergy between our universities and the industry. The divide is so huge that the industry now looks down on our universities. In the US, I did research that industries in the US don't get for universities to handle. But industries won't give back to Nigerian universities because they feel they are even superior to our universities. And I think it's a disgrace. So universities as we know them today will disappear in the next two or three decades. The reasons are obvious. Modern technology has made distance learning both attractive and convenient. You saw what COVID did. Why are federal and state universities two years behind others now? COVID. And because federal and state universities refuse to go into distance learning. You think somebody will take your job when you deliver your lectures on like that? It's impossible. It's when you don't even know how to do that that you will eventually lose that job. See what COVID has taught us. I was strong during the COVID. My own five-year granddaughter was in class at home on the dining table with her laptop, five years old, attending class from home on a laptop, five years old. And we, undergraduates, graduates, we can do that. The company now rules the world and is now demanding and preferring skills and professional certifications to university degree. I want to sound this note of warning to UNM because I don't know. Don't leave this university without acquiring certified skills. Get certifications in anything, maybe information technology, coding, and you know, um, software, uh, you know, development and things like that. Look for something you enjoy. Look for international organizations that can certify you. Because these are the things where the jobs start in the future if you don't want to set up your own business. All the job training and experience is now prepared by huge corporations which are perennially threatened by stiff net competition. Yes, they know they have competition. So what ideas are we proffering? Every university should adopt the entrepreneurial model where students are taught how to be independent and cope with their lives and environment instead of flooding the overcrowded job markets. When you grab the job market, poverty increases. When you create your own job, wealth increases. It is so important. That was why, when I was a vice chancellor of Federal University, I got the Senate to approve eight instead of two required by AUC. Eight courses in entrepreneurial studies. I hope they are safely doing that. Because I wanted whatever university I was in charge of to be the best. So I made the Senate to agree and we put it in the syllabus. Remember that what NUC gives you is minimum standard. And you cannot become excellent operating on minimum standard. You need standards that are higher than the minimum. That's why I got that university to put eight courses in entrepreneurial studies instead of the two NUC required. Since most university degrees are for all practical purposes, useless, skills and competences in various fields of life must be taught at undergraduate level. ICT must be deeply inculcated in our students that they are able to even teach themselves by assembling relevant knowledge from the information superhighway. These things are very important. No student should be allowed, I know, I hope you won't stone me for this, but no student should be allowed to graduate who does not possess enough ICT skills to personally set up 
pilot business model and or interface with industry, market, or social goals. Because if you can do this thing, God will be looking for you, not you looking for them. We have Nigerian young men and women who work from Nigeria, but they are paid in America, paid in Canada, because they are presumed to live in America and Canada, but their work is online. So they can live any part of the world that they should choose. When Nigerian government is building, setting up more universities, a more technology, technological institutions, technology giants among the nationals like Google, Apple, Netflix, Tesla, etc. have announced that from this year, university degrees will no longer be required to get a job with them. Only certification will be required. Google is even setting up a new program called Google Career, Career Shoes for young people to learn and to learn in the market online for six months. The irony is that the end certificate of this program will be placed at par with university degrees. If you don't take anything home, take this home. We must all now latch on to the paradigm shift. So certification is globally in demand scale. To do so, our young ones must acquire computing and data analysis skills. Future jobs in the international market will be in areas where such globally accepted certifications are needed. Skills in programming, software development, and application, creative apps, packaging, etc., will all be required. These are what we are looking for. Chaos and marketing will also be required. This will give you a huge advantage and we encourage you to do so. Some emerging areas showing great promise are in the domain of logistics. Many of you don't know, but logistics, the sector in the best of are not so. Government policies will participate and capitalize as companies to ensure that promising innovations are commercialized. Conclusion. Time was when the richest global companies were in oil, automobile, aircraft, manufacturing industries. Not anymore. Today, thanks to science and technology, the top ones are within the information technology family and the entertainment world. It was science and technology that made all this possible. It is the same mechanism that will keep all these games sustainable. The growth and development of science and technology in a country determines its level of wealth, strength, and general well-being. Both the US and Europe talk everything but the general multiplied with science and technology skills with giving this hidden population to become an undaunted giant and also becoming the second richest economy on earth, now donating money to any country that is ready to take it. The poorest countries are those with the least science and technology profile while the richest are those benefiting from massive deployment and leveraging of science and technology in all aspects of life. Science and technology have been the bedrock of most modern products, services and utilities. We are judicially deployed, although wealth has been generated as a result. So many, so many sectors such as health, transportation, aviation, Food, entertainment, military, construction, hospitality, industry, the things is endless have been transformed and made much more productive by science and technology. The result, of course, is all quantifiable wealth creation. Science and technology have given us various forms of alternative and renewable energy, which mitigate against environmental degradation. Such so renewable energy sources as solar, hydropower, wind, hydro level, etc., have been refined and perfected 
by science and technology to become cheaper, more efficient sources of electricity generation with much less environmental harm. Additionally, advanced instrumentation facilities in the geological and geophysical sector is reducing the cost and time needed for exploration and exploitation of all deposits and mineral deposits. Safe benefits are also seen in the construction and manufacturing sector. All are free from leveraging of science and technology. And finally, without science, engineering and technology, mankind will probably not have developed much beyond the soon age era. May God help us to use the best of science and technology to make our world a much safer, more prosperous, and more habitable place for all mankind. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, please let's let's appreciate that lecture with another round of applause. Thank you. You may you may you may not see that. Thank you. Um, let me thank you personally, um, Professor Nebo, for um, a fantastic lecture. That even I'm not the chairman, so I'm not even allowed to comment. I'm not even a comedian, so I'm not even allowed to play with that. But I was personally touched when he talked about Nigerians being left on earth. But I thought that you also taught us that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we are meek, we are the meek, we'll take over the head. Let them go. And so we take we take a music interlude. Uh, if you are ready, just something something simple and short, while we um, get the presentations ready, and then the order in which they'll be made. Um, music department, please give us something soft and soupy while we get the presentations ready. Um, the representative of the Nijok family um, informed us that his flight got moved and um, was expected to join us before we leave here. But if he doesn't. And uh, we'll take the team, we'll take the speech alone. So thank you, uh, DJ. Give us something um, to listen to. Thank you. And to the guests uh, of honor. And so, first, um, to the guest lecturer, Venerable Professor. Uh, and so the cameraman has requested that you go downstairs so he can get a good view. Um, so you're, you're so fit. I wonder. I wonder how you do it. Thank you so very much. So fit. So fit. Um, so you want the microphone? On behalf of the Faculty of Biological Sciences, University of Nigeria, I present to you this plaque, a remembrance of your very qualitative and scintillating presentation as a guest lecturer in the 15th and in Jaco lecture. Congratulations, sir. Before the next 
person comes, I want to promise the guest lecturer that the lecture will be dissected and developed as a plan of action. To enable us achieve some of the ideas presented in the lecture. So, being of engineering, I think of uh, biological sciences, you must come to my office and develop that plan. You must end it. Thank you very much. The next presentation will be made to the chairman of um, the lecture, uh, His Excellency, the distinguished Senator Hope Zodima, presented by Honorable Director Samuel. An applause. Thank you very much. The chairman of the equation, Senator Hope, who's a demo here represented, was the 14th guest lecturer to an enjoyable lecture. And today, he has come to become our chairman. He believes in the ideas left behind by an Njoko and also believes in the faculty of biological sciences. On behalf of the faculty, I made this presentation in recognition of your contribution, sir. Thank you very much, sir. This presentation will be made to the guest of honor, Mr. Uzoma Mokore. Thank you, thank you very much. The special guest of honor is a friend of the Faculty of Biological Sciences. He has interest in development, particularly the laboratories. And the Dean of Biological Sciences had on the need for a good scientific lab. I believe that something will happen today. <laughs> May God bless you, thank you. So, on behalf of the faculty, I make this presentation to honor this particular event and in remembrance of our late Tenny Jobo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like that. Thank you very much, um, Vice Chancellor, for applying to the faculty and uh, performing that task. Thank you, thanks, Minister. And next, well, I think it should be a music later, but we're taking one as the presentation was going on, so that's taking care of. Um,
So next item 17 will be taking speeches and presentations as not only the chairman should uh, direct, but if I say should it anticipate. Um, let me invite first uh, Mr. Moore, the designer of the system. The Vice Chancellor, University of Nigeria and Soka, Professor Charles Dewey. Let me introduce myself to those present here today. The management staff of the University of Nigeria, the families of next David Joko present here today, deans of faculties, heads of departments, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, today's occasion is very inspiring. When we look at the great achievements of our hero today, the late Professor Emin Jago, who dedicated his life to improving humanity by his contribution to science and technology. This goes to tell us that he will have dedication and passion for whatever career we choose, a day that it is will come. Long after we are gone, when we leave it, we will gather to honor our endeavor. I will therefore, on the strength of this, encourage our students to always prepare themselves to academic pursuits. Taking a cue from what is happening today, a day may also come in their lives when such honor may be accorded to them. May I therefore promise on behalf of myself and my friend, who is the President Limited, to confirm with the organizers of the lecture to provide some laboratory equipments to the Faculty of Biological Sciences in honor of today's student, the President of the Distinguished guests, thank you for having me. God bless. Over the And next, um, we'll take a, a brief presentation, not by, I guess, Obama, but by a uh, faculty professor of the Faculty of Biological Sciences who wants to make a little presentation that we expect to provoke into action and not only the president, not only the chairman, not even the special guest, but everyone else. That is absolutely in mind with the theme of today's lecture. Please, a pleasure to invite Professor F.C. Chilaka to make the presentation. Please, an applause. Mr. Chairman, sir, the Emeritus Vice Chancellor of the University of Nigeria, Professor Nebo, members of the High Table. Um, in 2018, I was a member of the Governing Council and Senator Hoku Sodima was here. And so by, by chance, I had some contact with him. And even collected his contact. But I'm very sure that because of the nice rules he's building in the state, he doesn't have more time to talk to anybody. I remember some years ago, when to move from Okigwe to where it was so terrible. About a month ago, when we went to bury our colleague and our friend, uh, Uncle D, Dr. Ejekwe, it took us only about, about 15 minutes to move from Okigwe to Mugano. A journey that normally takes about 
about 45 minutes. So we thank the governor. And I was looking forward to see him today. Because in his last, when he came here last, he talked about the role of, academic, of the intellectuals in nation building. Today, I would like to talk about the current work in the, in the faculty which we are proposing. Luckily enough, Professor Nebo is here, who is a material engineer. You will be able to understand part of what I'm going to say. Now, the first person I want to ask is, if you go to your doctor, and your doctor tells you, after examining you, that you have one more week to leave, what will you do? If you go to your doctor, your doctor tells you, you have one more week to leave, what will you do? There will be many... But at the end, my suggestion is, try another doctor. Try another doctor. This happened to be a man who went to his doctor. And his doctor told him that he has a heart problem. So, but the doctor told him that there is a certain professor at the University of Nigeria that you should contact him to see whether there is an advice. So when the man was contacted, the professor invited him to his house. Now, when he, to, uh, sorry, to his uh, lab, when he arrived at the, at the professor's lab, they, he switched on his CT scan equipment, switched on his MRI equipment, the CT is a kind of X-ray machine, the CT is a, the MRI is a magnetic resonance equipment which which uses uh, radio frequency to be able to find out the content of water in the tissue and so you'll be able to give you a scan of the tissue so that is the first thing that you see there so when the man got there he had a scan of the heart and after the scan the scan was digitalized using a computer to make an image of it uh, oh yes i think you need to uh, make it turn it in such a way that I can also see. It's a very short presentation. Okay. Now, after the digitalization, it was now sent to a, a 3D printer. What does the 3D printer do? The 3D printer uses ink and paper but in this case it is called a 3d bioprinter the 3d bioprinter uses ink and paper but the ink and paper will be different the ink is called a bio ink while the paper is called a 3d scaffold the 3d scaffold the 3D scaffold can be, you can get it from a material that you can extract from the African giant snail, mushrooms, and the rest. And so the, the, the material to do this work is available. So now, what do you do? You now send the, you now take the material you are going to collect from the snail, a compound called kytosan, and then you will use it to construct a scaffold. Now, while the patient was in the, in, the, in the professor's lab, the professor also took a part, a, a, a specimen from the patient. The idea of the specimen is to grow stem cells. So, and the stem cell is the bio ink you are now going to use. So, now by a process called bioprinting, which is an additive manufacturing process, you now put the bio ink, you now put them into the scaffold. After putting the bio into the scaffold, you will produce something like this. 
after the ink has, the, the stem cells have been put into the biofilm, you now send it to a bioreactor. And the bioreactor will grow a new heart. This is the current thing that is happening. So there are two processes, two processes in this. One is called bioprinting, the other one is called electrospinning. These things are not very expensive materials. But the point is that we must begin to think about stopping our people from going abroad to go and get what we can do at home here. It requires a little finance to be able to produce both kidney, heart, skin, bones. If you look at the second one, these are what you can produce now guidance for the wood dressing, blood vessels, heart valves, bone cartilage, and the heart itself. You can bioprint it. I'm sorry, the the, the PowerPoint I prepared that got infected with virus. And so that was how I had been running around and now sweating like a Christmas goat. So, but the only, the most important thing is that it is possible, it is possible already, there are things we call microfluidic uh, chips, which are organs on chip, which are already being used by in the body in most, in most advanced countries. But this process has to do with what, uh, what we call nanoparticles, and which are some those in physics and the rest we know about, but I don't want to go into those ones because let it not be confusing. But the more most important thing is that, sir, it is possible to produce an artificial heart. It is possible to produce an artificial kidney. It's also possible to uh, produce an artificial bone. So these are the things we are already, we have, uh, we already have uh, some communication with uh, those in electrical engineering to produce some of the equipment required. The most important equipment in this case is one, what is called the power pack, which will supply you up to 50 kV, 50 kV, not kVA, 50 kV of power, and which will drive the electric spinning process. Then we require a 3D printer, the process of the extruding and the rest are all no. They are not. They are not new things. They are not. They are not jets. So there are already processes that are known. We have the process. We have the theory. We have the the, the wheel in our faculty. You see, this is why we talk about man being made in the image of God, and that is God's ability to procreate. But we academics, what we do? We will go and spy on God. We will hack into his systems of ideas, download them, reformat them, and then use it to treat our fellow human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chilaka. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Mao. Exciting on our watering uh, presentation. Uh, I guess we got the right response. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks also for keeping it brief. Um, so, next, uh, I'm supposed to make some announcements, which I'm very ready. Uh, I'm wondering if the chairman is ready. If the chairman is ready, the chairman is Thank you very much again. I like all the existing protocols again. First of all, I want to thank the university community, particularly the faculty that is in charge of this uh, of lecture series, for initiating this lecture series. And as we have seen today, uh, it provides a very veritable platform for the generation of ideas that can change this country. I want to say that all of you should join me in thanking Professor Nebo for this wonderful talk to lecture. Of course, those who know Professor Nebo, sorry, would not have expected anything 
less. He is a uh, equal to the tax, and he has given us a lot of food for thought. The most important thing is the correlation, very unassailable correlation he has drawn between science and technology and wealth creation and national development. I think it is, it is very important that we recognize that. And uh, his reference to the future of science and technology uh, really is something that we take home and uh, sure by it. I'm so happy that the university has promised that they will also reduce this lecture into uh, action points and uh, uh, be able to uh, do something with it. That means that they listen to uh, his excellence when he was talking. And so at, at least that will mean that we begin to start something that all of us will be happy and proud that uh, we are making the lecture more practical, more practical and uh, therefore we have the society more. When Prof talked about Nigerians ruling the world, and uh, uh, everybody was thinking that maybe he would say that in that 50 years, Nigerians would have put up their own technology and would be that of America and of everybody. But when he ended up telling us that by then, everybody would be in the outer space and the only Nigerians left here, so they would be ruling the world. It reminded me of something very similar, which should also agitate our minds about the story that uh, a comedian told at a function. He said that when Abasha was the head of state, he went to a conference in uh, Switzerland. And so when he was, when they were about leaving, he had the privilege of joining uh, the president of America and the president of uh, France in their aircraft. So as they were coming, they first went to America. The pilot said that uh, all the communication gadgets in the aircraft uh, had to do some fault. So the only way he will know which one is your country is that you will go fly very low. So when he gets to your country, you point at a, a, a remarkable uh, statue or something that will identify your country. So he first flew into American space. And when they got a little bit down, the president of America saw the Statue of Liberty say, at this American landman, landman, and the pilot landed. Then he went to France. And then uh, they also got down. And the president of France saw Elfair Towers and said, hey, this is France, you can land. So Abasha was thinking, when they get to Nigeria, what is going to be the landman? So he was thinking, he was thinking. So they got to Lagos. He said the pilot should go down, down very well, let him check that he's uh, not wearing his red glasses. So, so when the pilot got there, he brought out his gold pistols and opened the, the, the aircraft window. And that gold in and they slashed his ears, this is my thing. <laughs> so, so you see, it's similar to the, what Prof just said, because that means that while others are moving, we are running behind. So I hope that this lecture will provoke us enough to really think of how to move on in the world. I want to thank the prof for this wonderful lecture. And I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to share this location. And I promise that uh, His Excellency has directed me to assure the uh, faculty that in his uh, characteristic manner, he will do something that will encourage the faculty very, very well. I will whisper that to the team before I leave. And uh, so he wants you to know that he will always support you in whatever you are doing or whatever you will do to uh, continue to sustain the good and wonderful name of Professor Joko to the people and uh, for the people to also profit from his legacy. Thank you very much. I